Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're here in the room or watching it virtually. Um, Friday the 13th, let us hear that that is not a curse upon this evening. Uh, so far, it's worked out all right. <laughs> we are so pleased to have Dorothy McTierno here from Perth, Australia, but she's Irish. We've done uh, virtual events together. Actually, one of my proudest achievements was doing an event with Catherine Ryan Howard in Dublin at 10 p.m. <laughs> I was here at 2 p.m. and Dervla was in Perth at, what was it, 9 o'clock the next morning. Yeah. But we, I mean, that's that's the virtual world is you have to work out time zones, but we did, we did a wonderful work. program. Yeah, it was really great. So she's here with her new book, The Murder Rule. And our host is T.J. Newman, author of, I don't have a copy with me, How I told you we're off our game, um, <laughs> of Falling, which was an enormous bestseller debut last year. She's working on a new book, she tells me, and um, she's going to be talking to Dervla, and I'll butt in like I usually do. <laughs> and Patrick may appear around the corner with questions from you, the audience, who are watching it, in case you have any. So, Tori, I'm going to turn this over to you, and brace yourself for interruption. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Anything could happen. Anything could happen. It's Friday the 13th. <laughs> Um, this is my first time, by the way, hosting and doing anything like this. So no I'm, way. Yeah, I know. I'm a little <gasps> nervous. I'm up here, obviously, with the champ, with Barbara, the legend, and we're here. Okay, we'll, we'll get through it, though. We will. Um, Dervla, I feel like, needs um, a decent introduction, and I wrote it all out because I glanced and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll get this. And I was like, oh, no, I need to write these all out. So we're here to celebrate and talk about the murder rule, but... It is Dervla's first standalone novel. Before this, she is the critically acclaimed international bestselling author of the Cormac McCarthy series, which is a top 10 bestseller, Amazon best book. It has been shortlisted, the series, the books in the series have been shortlisted for the Barry Awards, the Kate O'Brien Awards, the Australia Book Industry Awards, the Irish Book Awards, Western Australia Premier Book Awards. And her book that we're here to talk about tonight, The Murder Rule, standalone novel is already in Australia, the number one fiction, number one fiction book, number one book on Booktopia, the number one book on Amazon for Amazon Australia for new releases, number eight overall, and yes, overall meaning like every book that Amazon sells, number eight <laughs> single digits, that's who. Um, number one on Apple, number one on Demix, number one crime thrill on Audible, number one on, yeah, it's embarrassing, but no, I'm not done, I'm not done. It's embarrassing how good you are at this. Number one at readings, readings and it's a number one pre-ordered title on Booktopia. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tori. <laughs> and this is her publication week. She just launched, you know, on Tuesday, The Murder Rule, first time in America. So I feel like we are just now um, over here getting to, yes? Not her first time in America. We were just having that discussion. <laughs> Actually, Durfla and I met at VoucherCon, which is the International Mystery Convention, in November of 2019. But she did not come on to the poison pen with four of her fellow Australians yeah. who had this really cool grant from Australia, and it included Sulari Gentle. Who are the other three? Emma Vistich, um, Jock Sarong. Jock Sarong, Emma Vistich. We have Zoomed with her and another very nice oh, man whose name is Dave Sleeper. And the thing, the thing she missed was that the Australians completing whatever they were doing in the daytime and asked they were going to go to the Grand Canyon, but they had a flight the next morning. And I thought, logistically, how are they going to do that? But they actually did. <laughs> they drove all the way to the Grand Canyon, That's probably saw story. moonlight or whatever it is, and made it back to Sky Harbor. So, but Dervla was not part of that. Because effort. I am Irish, and they are Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I love them, right. you know. Right. Anyway, sorry, but I just thought I should correct that, because some people may have met Dervla at, um, in Dallas. There you go. Well, for the rest of us who are just lucky enough to be sort of getting on board now, that's um, the exhaustive list of, of <laughs> what you have done. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about the book, but let's talk about you first, because you are fascinating. Oh my God, the pressure, the pressure in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Told you it was well, therapy. You. We're just yeah. going to really break it down. Let's talk about your childhood. No. Um, <laughs> this really. is not therapy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You have a fascinating, fascinating backstory, and it ties into the murder rule because the murder rule is a legal thriller. 
um, written about the legal profession, and you come from the legal profession. Yes. 12 years, am I correct? I was a lawyer for 12 years in Ireland, yeah. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I often meet women who are lawyers, and we always say, I'm a recovering lawyer, and you too, we have to be too. Yeah. Me too. Me too. There right. you go. Many escapees from the law. I set up a little legal practice when I was 26, which seemed like a very good idea at the time. And it was very successful until it wasn't. Um, we were doing really well, and then the economic crash came in 2007. When the subprime crisis hit in the US, it had a really enormous knock-on effect in Ireland. Very dramatic. Yeah. It's kind of hard to explain how bad it was unless you were there. House prices dropped by about 50%. A lot of people lost their jobs. Very few families escaped without at least one job loss. If you kept your job, you probably took a pay cut of about 30%, and taxes were going up. So the economy kind of ground to a halt. And I was in a situation where my clients needed a lot of help, probably more help than they had before, but they couldn't afford to pay their bills, which is understandable, but it meant I couldn't pay my bills. So things got hard fast, and we did three or four years of that working our way through it. It was very tough, and by the end, I never wanted to practice law again. I think I was pretty burned out before that even happened. Yeah. By the end of it, I was just, that's it. Tana, so, French wrote, Tana French wrote one of her books about that. Do you remember? Yes, it's Broken Harbor. Yeah, Broken yeah. Harbor was about the effect mm. of the property collapse in Ireland. She wrote one of her very As powerful books. the states, because we were left with situations. Yeah. Like, I, I give you an example. My husband's from a small town in Sligo. And just outside that small town, there was a little housing development built beforehand with about 22 houses. I think the first one of those sold before the crash for about 220,000 euros. And after the crash, all of the rest of the houses together sold for about 230,000 completely. Wow. So, and, and most of them would be left unoccupied. You know, they were being built in weird places where people didn't want to live because it was just this crazy bubble. And so these ghost estates were left over. So after all that, we decided we wanted a fresh start and we chose Australia. Um, and I'd never been, I'd never even set foot in the country, but Kenny, my husband, had backpacked, backpacked there 10 years before. So he, we were going to either go to Brisbane or Perth because that's where all the engineering work was, and he was an engineer. And he said, Darby, you choose where we go. It's your call. All I'll tell you is that in Brisbane, the cockroaches can fly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK, Perth it is. <laughs> that's how we decided where we were going to live. We've been there for 11 years. <laughs> Did you ever find out if that were true? Yes, but mm -hmm. apparently they also fly in parts of Perth. So I feel very misled. However, I haven't seen them, so it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Any regrets now that? No regrets. When we got on that plane, we wrote a list of, you know, maybe, possibly, if we're really lucky, some of these things might happen. And every single thing of that list happened and way beyond what we'd ever hoped for. I mean, it's Australia has been incredibly good to us. It was hard. I mean, our baby, our second baby was born five weeks after we landed and we didn't know anybody. It was just us. The big concern was like we had a two-year-old little girl as well where you know who could we have to be with Freya while I'm literally in labor because I didn't want to do it by myself that's how alone we were um, so it was really hard in the early days but it was worth it Australia's been really good to us so it's home now that's wonderful and let's talk about the transition then from being a lawyer to this because there's also two kids involved how did that transition go yeah I just I think Kay and I we kind of made a Packed, you know, we had really been very responsible in Ireland, sort of box ticky kind of people doing everything by the rules. So we said when we come to Australia, you know, Ireland kind of didn't work out for us. So maybe if we do it our own way now, we, we've got just as much chance. So I really wanted to write. Problem was, as I mentioned, Oshin was born five weeks after we landed. He didn't sleep for two years. So that slowed me down a little bit. <laughs> But then in 2014, I said, OK, that's it. I'm really going to try. I was working during the day at the time for the Mental Health Commission, still writing contracts, and then with the kids in the afternoon. And I wrote every night, every every single night except Thursday, because you get to it, the night before you don't mess with wine night, and that was Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, I wrote every night. And then it just kind of started to happen. It was good. And did you, when you started querying to get an agent, was, I mean, was that an easy process? How was your road to publication the first time? It was very dramatic. I think I've, I don't know if you guys have heard this story before, and if you have, I, I apologize, but I, um, I had been having headaches. I'd been writing this book, and it was finished, but I wasn't quite ready to send it off. I ended up sending it to one agent only through this Twitter pitch competition thing. I heard nothing for months. I was still polishing the book. 
life went on. I was having a lot of headaches at the time, and Kenny insisted that I see the doctor. And we came to one Friday in July in 2016, and I was going to see my GP. And my, it wasn't my GP, it was just a GP I'd been to visit, and I came in to see her, and she was clearly a little bit nervous, I could tell. And she just said, Dervla, you have a brain tumor, and it's really serious, and have you noticed that you've lost any sight yet? And I said, no. And she said, well, you know, she told me very clearly that the prognosis will be that you'll first you'll lose your peripheral vision, and then you'll lose all of your sight, and then ultimately it will be fatal, unless you have surgery. And so she took her reference book down from the bookshelf, and she looked up neurosurgeons, and she found the names of three neurosurgeons, and she wrote them on a yellow post-it note, and she gave it to me. And she said, now, the first one of these who will see you is who you need to see. And I said, okay. And I took it out to the car, and I sat in the car with this post-it note on my phone, thinking, I don't want to make these calls at home because the kids, you know, the, you know what small children are like, as soon as you get on the phone, they come running. Um, and so I started Googling the name so I could find the numbers, and my phone buzzed with an email. And it was from that literary agent in New York saying she'd read my first 50 pages and really liked them, and could I send her the rest of the book? And that's when I started looking for the cameras because mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'm, there's something weird going on here. <laughs> But I got home and I told Kenny, I took him upstairs and, and I said, look, there's good news and there's bad news. <laughs> and he said, okay, give me the bad news. And I told him about the tumor and he was obviously very upset that I was saying, but there's a literary agent. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so silly looking back. But at the time, the, the drama of that moment, you know what that's like, Tori. When, you know, as a writer, you're just, I was just hoping for a personalized rejection from agents in the beginning, you know, because that means they see some potential in you. And suddenly I have this, but also this. This doesn't make sense. Ultimately, and I ended up having three weeks between that diagnosis and the surgery. And I just spent that time sending the book out to literary agents. I think because I wanted to believe there was going to be something the other side. And then about four weeks after the surgery, which thankfully went well, I got the first email from an agent saying they wanted to have a chat with me over Skype, which usually means that they think they'd like to represent you, but they want to make sure you're not crazy. <laughs> and I just said to Kenny, I can't have the very first conversation right. be, I've just had brain surgery, <laughs> and the next book's going to be amazing. Um, so I couldn't tell her. So I, I put on way too much makeup, and Kenny helped me stuff the pillows behind my back, and I sat up really straight, and I was super perky for 20 minutes, and then I slept for 26 hours <laughs> solidly <laughs> afterwards, because I was still very much recovering. Mm. And then the book went out on submission. Uh, well, she said, my agent sent it out on a Friday, and I knew what to expect, because we all do as writers. You know, you hear nothing for months, and then probably won't sell your first book, because that's just the way it goes. But she rang me the following Tuesday and said, we have a preemptive offer. It was really generous, particularly by Australian standards, by any standard of book advances these days, and I was so excited. And she said, I think we need to turn it down. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> because that means it's off the table, you know, it's done. She said, no, I think you need to wait. And I rang my husband in a panic. And he was like, Derv, calm down. <laughs> you know, you have to trust your agent. She knows what she's talking about. We've got to just go with this and see what happens. So we waited and we waited. And within two weeks, we had six more offers of publication. So we had this little auction. And I got to go to Melbourne and Sydney and meet the last two publishers and talk to them. And it was the complete flip of what you think is going to happen, because they're there telling you what they're going to do for your book. and we're going to do this, and they had a whole presentation, and I didn't say a word, not a word in any of these meetings, because it felt so surreal. And I genuinely had these moments where I was sitting there going, I don't think the surgery went well. I think I'm still on a morphine bit. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> fantasizing about all of this stuff. And it just went from there. The first book became a top 10 bestseller, and then The Scholar was a top 5 bestseller, and then The Good Turn went all the way to number one. And there have been so many moments along the way where I've been like, this doesn't make sense in my life. You know, like my first event was with Louise Penny on stage at the Adelaide Writers Festival, and there were 450 people there to see Louise, but I was sitting beside her, you know, yeah. pinching myself. And I kept thinking, this doesn't make sense, but someday I'll be at home in my kitchen and I'll, it'll all make sense suddenly, and I'll pour a glass of wine, I'll sit down, I'll celebrate it then. But in the meantime, just keep doing the next thing. And it, I don't know about you, you feel the same way, Tori, but it is still does not make any sense. So I'm still waiting for that moment. <laughs>
My next question was, have you actually had that no, wine? Have you gotten there? But I've had the wine, but not the yeah. making sense for anything. <laughs> the wine's the constant companion, yeah. but the well. disbelief is also the constant <laughs> companion. Yeah, I get That's it. it. That's such an amazing story. So how does it feel going from a a series like that, that, you know, like you said, is disbelief and you're just, you're living with the same characters, you're, you know, living in the same world. Now you got to stand alone. It's a completely different set of circumstances, new character, new everything. Yeah. How has that transition been? I've really enjoyed it. I think there's something very freeing about writing the standalone. You know, with with a series, you're trying to do different things, and you've got time to let it unfold. And it's about investing in those characters that you know you're going to be with for a little bit of time. But by the end of it, it can feel. A little, I only did a series over three books, but it does feel a little constrained. You know, there are certain things you can and can't do. Certain things belong in this world, and certain things don't. And then you come to something new and fresh, and anything goes. There's a, te you know, there's a temptation to go a little bit crazy. You've got to pull back a little bit. But it's fun. I mean, it was very freeing. That's how it felt for me. I love that. I love that. So creatively, it's hard. Barbara and I were talking about, before this got started, how hard it is to talk about books like this when it's like the week of their publication. Because most <laughs> of the people here haven't read it yet because it just came out. And you're picking up your books here yeah. you know, at the event. So there's so much that we would want to talk about in this book. Well, we can't because this book is full of nothing but <laughs> twists and turns and just spoilers all over the place. Spoilers everywhere, left and right. <laughs> so you got to be very careful as you as you talk about the book to not give anything away. Um, but I, I I feel like I'm not giving anything away to say that in these twists and turns you have no idea what's going on. It's really <laughs> no. I, I mean, as a reader, it's a compliment. That's okay. thing. As okay. as that sounded terrible, but I mean, as a reader, I didn't know. I was so. In, I got you. you Actually, got you know, it's a really interesting idea. What if she hadn't had any idea what was going on, know. and it all unfolded, Terry? I, I really kind of like that. Yeah. I'm here to ask what happened. I don't get it. No. no, the book, everything makes perfect sense. It's just that well done that it twists and turns oh, in a way so that you're just like, I don't know. I mean, like sometimes you know, you 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 know, you kind of know who did what, yeah. and who's doing what, and most of the time, just when I think that it's one thing. Then the next turn comes, and I'm like, well, the, okay, no, it's not that. Oh, it's I'm really, so the plot is so woven masterfully like that. How do you, from a craft standpoint, do that? Do you start out knowing what the end will be, how the twist will go? How does that work for you craft-wise? Sometimes I know. I, I always have, know that I always have an ending available to me, worked out, when I'm working on the outline, because I need to know I can bring it somewhere, or I could end up in a complete dead end. Yeah. But I might write a totally different ending, as, you know, because you know, as, the, as you write the characters, you get to know them better, and new things start to occur that are a bit more organic. So I know some of the twists and turns going in for sure, but some of them I really didn't. The main one that happens quite late was mm -hmm. just entirely organic, just an idea, and I went, oh my god, that's going to work, and it'll all come together. And it's lovely when it happens like that. I can't remember who it was who described this. I, I, I might be a Stephen King thing where he talked about stories being found things yeah. that you excavate. Mm -hmm. And I remember before I was a writer reading that and thinking, that's ridiculous. Of course they're not found things, you know. <laughs> no more than when Liz Gilbert talks about ideas floating through and moving on to the next person. But somehow it does feel that way when you're actually writing. It feels like something that already existed and you're just discovering a little bit more the further you go in. Right. Do you that, don't you think that happens when the you know if the plot arises from character? Because if you're doing an Agatha Christie sort of a plot, mm -hmm. where the characters are really subordinate to you know to mm -hmm. the mechanics, yeah, to the mechanics of it, then that's not likely to happen. Mm -hmm. But if it's really character driven, as your books are, then you can in fact be surprised. Well, I love that. I think that there's a lot of truth to that. Though I think the way Agatha Christie writes is so brilliant. I love I love her books, and I think she puts a lot of work into the antagonist up front, possibly. She's good on, on that. And actually, in, in crime fiction, the villain, most books really rise and fall on the villain, not on the, on the protagonist, mm. you know, a great villain. It, for a thriller, it's essential. Mm. For a detective story, perhaps less so. Mm. And, you know, the whole serial killer genre depends on how, you know. I mean, how many of us, and thinking about Silence of the Lambs, really think about, you know, the FBI agent. No, it's all about, you know, Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. I mean, he's the one that dominates Drives the, the book. Thing. 
So I think I think if you're a character driven author, would you agree, Terry, that you're likely to be surprised where, you know, yes, it would be more difficult if you if you were doing something where the structure of the plot maybe was preeminent. Absolutely, and it was that was actually a question that I have was in this book when I was reading it. There were, did you have a a aim to make it? plot driven, character driven, or theme driven? Because all three of those aspects are so strong in this book that I really wondered, like, did you start out aiming for any one of those things as it's going to be this kind of book like we're talking about? Or was well, they're it... All, they're all really important to me. Theme was more important to me in this than it has been before. But it always starts with character. I always have to have a character that I feel really strongly about before I start a book. Elizabeth George has written a book about writing called Right Away. And when she, she talks about trying to figure out if you've got your idea or not, she said, don't use your head. Because your head will say, yes, this is clever, and I could do this, and I could do that. But it won't mean anything. Wait until you feel it in your gut. You have to feel a, a, a physical, emotional response to it, and then you know you've got something. So I've got to wait until I can find a character I can feel that way about. And the main character in this book is a young woman called Hannah Rokeby. And she is a young, idealistic law student, or so she appears. And she kind of cons her way into the Innocence Project on the eve of this major case. They're trying to free somebody from death row. And at first glance, she appears to be exactly what you'd expect. You know, this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, this young woman who's really eager to impress her professors and, and wants to change the world. But she's not like that at all. You know, under the surface, she's actually pretty ruthless. And she's definitely working for her own agenda. Well, basically, she wants to sabotage the project. Yes, she does, yes. we, can, we can say that. <laughs> and let me let me do a that. lawyerly thing here as one to another. Uh, Dervla's first three books take place in Galway, in Ireland, the Rune, um, the first one in Cormac. Is it Riley? Is that his Riley, name? Yeah. yeah, is the detective. This book, I don't know whether the Innocence Project exists in other countries. I haven't looked, but the Innocence Project is a very American thing. There's one in Chicago um, I, that I know about, Northwestern University. Michael Harvey wrote a book about it and so forth. And it's basically, is, it's, it's looking at criminal or, or people that are incarcerated whose all their legal options have expired. And so there's one last possible chance to, um, to save them. And so this book really needed to be set in America mm -hmm. uh, rather than in Ireland if it was going to be the Innocence Project. And oddly enough, you chose, I just love this, you chose <laughs> the University of Virginia Law School in Charlottesville. Well, when I was reading the law, because I'm one of the last people that read the law instead of going to law school, I commuted from where I lived in Virginia to the law library at the University of Virginia. And this was like 19... When was it? 79. And the thing I loved the most is that when I went in the first time and there was, I went into the ladies room on the third floor and I looked at the walls and I observed that it was all urinals that had been ripped out and replaced by actual toilets because the transition to having any women studying law at the University of Virginia Law School had just happened. Oh, wow. And so you, know, you couldn't tell it unless you went into the bathroom and observed the absence of the urinals oh, and the presence of actual flush toilets. I still remember that, you know, because women, you know, it's so easy now to think that, you know, women are actually more women practicing law now. Yeah. And as law students, and there are men, but it wasn't true. Even when was this? 45, 40, well, I, I read the law in Virginia from 78 to 81. So it wasn't really that long ago. I, I thought about it when I, graduated, when I was at Stanford, and at that point they said to me, they obviously didn't say this to San, Sandra Day O'Connor, um, who was slightly <laughs> ahead of me, but they did say to me, if you go into law, you will probably be doing all domestic and juvenile law. And that didn't really interest me. Mm -hmm. So I went on and became a librarian instead. And eventually, you know, uh, went back to law. And then that was in 62. So there had been a change between 62 and 78, yeah. but now there's been a massive change. I don't know that we realize how far women have progressed in professions despite all the talk about mm -hmm. the glass. And I'm not, I'm not gonna touch the current mm -hmm. routine. Um, but, you know, women have made a lot of progress in the last 40 years, at least mm -hmm. professionally. Yeah, we think that, I think. <laughs> but I, I, I qualified as a lawyer, I'm trying to think, was it 98 or 99? 
when I qualified, there were we were fifty five percent women in my class. Wow. And the women were performing really well academically, but within twelve months of graduation, the men were already fifty percent higher pay rates than we were. Well, I, yeah, I we can, were, I we can were see that. We were We were all working the same job, same hours. Sure. You know, versus we were, we were a small class of about sixty, so I knew everybody. You know, it, could, it wasn't that the guys were better; it was just the way it worked. And well, the job that, market was still tilted in absolutely. in that direction. And, yeah. and maybe guys were better at advocating for themselves. I don't know, but. I talked to two female lawyers the other day in the context of this book on a podcast, American lawyers, and they're similar age to me and they're still practicing. And I was talking about how it had been when I was in my 20s that I was, you know, uh, I would go to meetings and it was all guys, you know, and they were all quite a bit older than me because we're meeting with the senior executive teams usually, so they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And there was a way you were expected to behave as a young woman. You know, you, you definitely needed to be good as, at your job, but just not make a thing of it, you know. And, and be polite and be pleasant if you can. If you can be charming, great, but there's a line. You know, you were just so careful all the time. Yeah. And so much of your brain was taken up with how are people responding? How am I dealing with this? Which is why I wanted to write this Hannah character and make her quite uncompromising. Yeah. Um, but I was saying to the women, you know, thankfully things have changed so much now. And they were like, mm, not so much, <laughs> 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 which surprised me. But I, ha I think it has changed for younger women. I think they're they're so inspirational. Do you, have you guys seen you've seen Carpool Karaoke? You know that James Corden TV mm -hmm. show thing. Mm -hmm. He does these little YouTube videos where he drives around as a celebrity in cars and they sing their music and stuff. And he did a Lady Gaga episode, and he's talking to her at one point about her lyrics, and kind of teasing her about them being obscure. And he says to her, you know, when you're working with your producers, do they do they when they read your lyrics first go? He makes his face, and she goes, Jane, first of all. They don't do that because I'm the boss. And it was just so beautifully done, you know. She wasn't over the top, but she was just clear and confident and really comfortable in her own power. And I just found that really inspirational. And I wanted to write a young woman who knew who she was. And like where she goes wrong is she's overly sure about being right about everything. But in her core confidence, I don't think she's wrong. She knows what she's good at, and so she just does things. Which makes her very complex because she does things and says things that you go, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not on board with this. I am not on board with this. But you so like her. And not just like like her, like, oh, I like that character. Like yeah. you believe in what she's doing and you, there's goodness there. And her intentions are well, even if what she's executing is not, not so admirable, not at, times. So admirable <laughs> yeah. at times. So it's like she's not, she's a very likable character. Is there a lot of you, because I'm hearing you tell your backstory about like, my goodness, you know, publishing, you know, dealing with agents being propped up, you know, post operation, <laughs> you know, that's quite a bit of strength. That's quite a bit of resolve. Is there a lot of you in her? Honestly, the opposite. I would love to think I, she's nothing like me and she's who I'd like to have been, I think. And not, I mean, not the ruthlessness, not, not some of the <laughs> stuff she does is pretty. <sighs> Um, but I love the fact that she is so, well, I know what's right, and I can do these things, so I will do these things. And there's nothing in between for her. She doesn't yeah. second guess herself. She doesn't consider, which, you know, taken to extremes is obviously a flaw, and she has to go on a bit of a journey in this book to learn a few hard lessons. But I really admire the fact that she goes about these things in such a strong way, and that's not me, to be honest. I, I second guess everything. Just constantly. And I, I know that about myself. I try to change it, but it's very hard to change who you are at core, you know? That's why we write characters that are aspirational. Yes, exactly. and like, well, <laughs> yeah. if I can't live that life, then they will, and I'll yeah. get through them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's also so interesting, thematically, there's so much. Obviously, we've got the Innocence Project. We're talking about, you know, um, convicted criminals. Like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of concepts of guilt, innocence, and also the blinders that we put up to see guilt or innocence and a sort of like confirmation bias, believing what we want to believe. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to read this book and see through all of the characters and all of their various stages of innocence and guilt, sort of evaluating those um, ideas and yeah. where they stand with that. It feels like right now in the world, there's a lot of that kind of going on of blinders and there's a lot of um, polarization and mm -hmm. I know the right way and I've got the the right way to look at this and then more information comes out and we're like oh wait maybe not did it, the current climate that we're in inform 
the way you wrote this. Oh, yeah. When you wrote this, was it like COVID time? Like what air? When yeah, was, er, you... for very early COVID, probably. I, I definitely have been so conscious of it in the last few years. I've been reading different books about the way our, we think. You know, I mean, mm. I think that um, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, was a real mm. eye opener. You know, we all think we know how our brains work, that we are logical creatures and we're not. Yeah. You know, it's mostly instinct and we think we assess information, we gather it up and we look at it and we say, okay, I'm deciding this way. But really what we do is we believe things and then we seek out pieces of information that confirm what we believe. And that's completely the way humans work and that's the way we've always been. But I think the problem is that social media is like a bomb that went off in the middle of that. And I don't think we've yeah. really assessed how impactful it is. It's feeding that much faster than it ever has before. And that's pushing us wider. Once you start clicking on something on any of the social media platforms, it will feed you more of the same faster. That's the, that's the really horrible part is that I made the mistake of shopping on something on Instagram. I do the Instagram for the store and I can't remember what I bought. And now, you know, every single time I'm, I'm checking the bookstore and all the rest of it, that's what I get, you know, or like a kazillion. So they do. They mm -hmm. mine the data and then they feed you what they, what they think, think you, you want. want or that you're comfortable <coughs> with. And a lot of people, you know, just accept that mm. as truth and, and don't bother to go mm. and think for because themselves. It's, it's so making easy. us robotic, it, I yeah. think, in a terrible way. You'd think that it would be opening us up to more people right. and more points of view, but it actually brings us into our own little gang. And, and it's dangerous. It silos right? us. It, yeah. it definitely, um, definitely do so. I think say. I want to talk about that a little bit in the book and just talk about that siloing of people and, the, and that process we go through where we stop looking for. We, we find it really hard sometimes to accept information that goes against our existing beliefs and to be open to it. And I wanted to point out that that happens both directions a little bit. And you do a very good job of that. As a reader, it was um, it was interesting. I always love when a book is like, yeah, you got the story, and then in the back of your mind, it's also tickling at like, that somehow is relatable to my own life in this way too, and it starts dredging things up. And it was it. I had that experience the whole time I was reading the book. That's great. Thank yeah, you. it was it was very well done. What kind of law did you practice? Oh man, I practiced commercial law, incredibly boring law. <laughs> I did um, why, very, yeah. very big contracts. You know, Ireland is such a small nation, but because it sits between the US and continental Europe, we trade both directions. So I worked a lot for smaller companies that traded with bigger companies like Siemens or Mitsubishi. And so you've got a 600 you know, page contract, 300 pages of contract and 300 pages of appendices and negotiated those, which I think actually is helpful for plotting. Because mm -hmm. when you are trying to keep a contract like that, you, you need to know if you, if you amend clause 1A, part 3, it's going to impact 26B and 43B and appendix A, part B. And it all is like a jigsaw moving all the time. And it was before Brexit, you know? Brexit yeah. would have complicated your life oh my God. even more. I didn't want to think about it. <laughs> a whole other layer. So once you, ha I think the mem your memory gets trained. Have you ever heard of the knowledge? Yes. The, the, you, the London cabbie thing? They have to do a test called the knowledge, where they have to learn all the different routes around London. And they've done MRI scans on guys who've been cabbies for 20 years, and their brains have, are, are different. There's more activity in certain areas to keep this map live. And I think it's similar with that sort of law, that you, you get a really good memory training, which maybe helps with plotting. I don't know, it's my theory. No, Not based you know, I, we, had a, we had a really interesting conversation Wednesday night with Alma Katsu, who spent 30 some years as a CIA analyst before she was taken to writing. Um, she writes historical horror. She's also written at least one great spy story. But she and I, and who was it? Like maybe it's just Patrick. Um, not just Patrick, sorry, Patrick. <laughs> See, and Patrick um, had a conversation about the fact that her years as an analyst trained her to have all this like quantum computing. That's the way her brain works. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yours works that way to some degree. Mine works that way to yeah. some degree. Um, in that we're very good at taking this huge web of stuff that looks all unrelated, but we create patterns yeah. out of it. And that's really what quantum computing, if you reduce it down to the, I mean, I sound like I know what I'm talking about. No, I <laughs> the only reason I know that, and I'm still trying to chase down the elusive book publishing in June that I have read, which I will eventually review for you, in which there is a clear discussion of what quantum computing is all about, which is the only reason I could even mention it at the moment. <laughs> but um, but I, I, you know, if you have enormous amounts of data 
and you are able to recognize connections in it. That's that's how it works, and that's what you do, and that's what you do, Tori. I'm sure. That's what I think all writers do that, don't you? I think you have to. You have to. It's yeah. hard to wrangle the cats, though. It made me think when you were going like this with your hands moving this way. Do you? Yeah. This is a craft question. Do you like physically have something? How do you physically do it? Are you just at a computer and letting your brain do that moving around, or do you like have blackboards or like what do you what do you do? I kind of do a few different things. I mostly start every writing session with pen and paper for at least half an hour, and that's just to get out of my own head. I don't know if you need to by do hand. That. You write by hand. Yeah, just okay. to, just to sort of. I usually feel very anxious when I'm starting to write, and I can't read my own stuff without just feeling nauseous. So <laughs> I have to get through that to the point where I can be productive. And a half hour with a pen and paper helps. I just, anything I'm thinking, whatever, just total lather. Oh, I forgot to put Freya's water bottle in her bag. I'll have to drop it down. You know, whatever's in my head. And then it just moves into, and in this scene, I'm going to have these characters, and this is what they know going in. This is what they don't know. This is what I'd like to happen generally. This is where physically they're going to be. These are the kind of things I'd like them to notice. What would Tom notice versus what would Mary notice? You know, all those thoughts. So that by the time my hands go to the keyboard, I know what I'm doing. That's just from a, just a first draft point of view. I always have a pretty good outline, pretty detailed outline, but I'm happy to abandon it. And when it actually comes to the really hardcore plotting, when the book's pretty advanced, I use Scrivener. So I've got my scenes. In a, it's, a, it's a piece of software most writers use. You can keep your scenes in a little list, and you can move them around easily in the book. So you can reshape it as you need to. And then you name your scenes exactly what's happening in them, so you can see at a glance. I've occasionally tried to do the JK Rowling thing with a spreadsheet, where you've got, she has, people have taken handwritten spreadsheets she did in the past, where she wrote out, you know, main plot, this is what's happening, subplot, this is what's happening in each chapter. It just doesn't really work for me that well. So I think just using the Scrivener scene list works best. Hmm. What about you? What do you do? I'm, I'm sitting here, I ask that question, in my mind I'm taking notes, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to try that tomorrow. Curry's working on her second book. So. Oh, yeah, completely. Oh, yeah, I'm no, taking notes. This, that was a selfish question on my part. I'm just like, tell me more about your process. Um, I don't, mine feels like a herd of cats that I try to wrangle together, and some days it makes sense to do, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very visual person, and color helps for me. Yeah. So I use a lot of different colored pens to do different, like, plot lines and um, different colored um, note cards and I, I have a you lay them out I tape them up I have ah. my, my laundry room is like double doors uh, to my laundry room and it's just you know needing the red yarn and it's very <laughs> questioning Amazing. questionable looking and it's just covered constantly and just like moving things around like a puzzle so. and yet your origin story if I recall it um, you wrote down the basic idea for the falling on a napkin while you were sitting in a plane. She was a stewardess. Yeah. Um, I should say flight attendant. Sorry, I'm being old-fashioned here. Didn't you write it down on a napkin? I did. That's I, right. So yeah. even Tori has used the same technique here. Yeah, and it, it morphs over time. The idea for this, was there like a lightning bolt moment where you came up with this, or how did you get... It came from concept? a newspaper article I read quite a few years ago about a young Irish law student who came to the U.S. for her summer and she volunteered for the Innocence Project. And she went back to Dublin and she couldn't forget the case she'd been working, so she kept working it. She kept making phone calls. Eventually she tracked down a retired police officer who pointed her to some hidden evidence. And with that evidence, a man who spent more than 20 years in prison was free. And I just, I mean, I thought it was amazing. I had been a young law student working in Bar Harbor for the summer as a chambermaid and a waitress and having a lot of fun and not doing anything meaningful. And she had, you know, changed this fundamentally important thing. But I didn't feel like there was a story there for me to write. You know, I thought it was kind of done. And then a couple of years later, I don't know if I came across it again or if it was just in my mind and I looked it up, but I read more into it. And it turned out that after she found the evidence, it took another five years for the case to be heard. Ouch. And by that time, he'd been in prison for 26 years. And he had three years left to run his original sentence. And I just thought, Jeez, that's so sad and dark and more complicated. And why had the other story been the one that was so heavily out in the world without this important bit of information? And I was just sitting there thinking, well, maybe the editors preferred this more inspirational take you know, of the various papers. Or maybe, what if? The Innocence Project had this sophisticated PR team that was sending these stories out, kind of tidied up, because they knew it would get more play. Now, I have no reason to think that, other than just my own twisted head. But I thought, if they were doing it, would I blame them for it? You know, they're trying to do something really important in a world that doesn't care. 
just doesn't care because we're so busy and it's so loud and so noisy now. Trying to get people's attention is really hard. So if someone takes one step off that straight and narrow path, and then another step, and then another step, where does that leave them? And once I started thinking like that, I thought, oh, I think there's a story here. So it was just thinking I can invert this. Instead of having this young, idealistic girl who's volunteering for the Innocence Project, what if she wasn't quite so idealistic? And then it felt like, oh, this could be fun. That's very cool. <laughs> and it, it's cool to see also all the different characters wrestle with that and come at that question of, what is your motivation? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this? How does this, there's a, a one, of, one of the last pages of the book has a paragraph that really stuck out to me. Um, where she asks, you know, basically the, the guy who sort of runs the Innocence Project, like, why do you do this? Mm -hmm. And his answer struck me, and I guess it's towards the end of the book, it's not really giving anything away, but it's still, you know, like, kind of the end. But did that paragraph, was that sort of yeah, that your, was, was that totally you? key for me, because yeah. I, I needed to answer the question that the book was asking at some point, which is, you know, like, what do you do in a world where, you know, people talk about it being a post-truth world? Like, how do you believe anybody anymore? And how do you find meaning? And it's so easy to be cynical. Like, that's the easiest path, and we all fall into it all the time. But if we're all cynical, what happens next? So trying to find a way to deal with the world as it is, not the way we wish it was, and still do something, and still make a difference. How do you find a way to do that, or a motivation to do that? Or practically, how do you do it? And I wanted to try and have a go at answering that question. So that paragraph is my best attempt. <laughs> it stuck out to me. It made me stop, and I read it several times. It, yeah, it stuck out. Um, is the way that the kind of law that she goes after and what this book deals with, is that also aspirational? Because I know it's not what you practice, but oh in a different world, if you would have practiced this kind of law, would you have stuck with it? I think maybe, although I think I wouldn't be surprised if you burn out, burn out with it. I mean, were you yeah. ever some, tempted to go down that path, Barbara? Yeah. Um, Mine was a very peculiar path, but I did a lot of trial work, even though I was a law student. The judges in Virginia under that program could qualify people like me to do trial work if they felt you were up to it. And there was no legal aid in Virginia, in that part of Virginia at that time. And so the state paid something like $50 if you were defending someone, you know, public defender sort of thing. So I was the most popular person in the entire bar because um, since I was a student, I worked for free and, you know, because I was learning. And so I did a ton. I've never forgotten my first trial was in federal court in Avenue, Virginia, where I had to qualify 35 FBI witnesses of a bank robbery. I was terrified. Um, I don't know, you know, because I, I, be, I ended up becoming the plaintiff in a, an enormous medical malpractice case which I won, so it was a good thing I'd been a law student all the way along. Um, and I know, so I never had to decide mm -hmm. whether I really wanted to do criminal defense work or yeah. prosecution. You know, I probably would have come down on the prosecution side mm -hmm. if I had a thought. You point out, I think it's in your book, or maybe because I'm reading so many legal mm -hmm. thrillers at the moment, um, that in truth, maybe 90% of people who are tried really are guilty. Mm -hmm. The, the, it's it's a fairly rare mm -hmm. thing, and especially now with more forensic evidence um, and more attention to um, racism and so forth, that there are fewer innocent defendants. You know, mm -hmm. and that's a hard bar to cross if you are a defense attorney and you're pretty sure your client is guilty. I don't think I could have done that. Yeah, I really don't. Um, I'm the sort of person who reads a serial killer book, and I always want I always want them to kill him before we, because the justice system isn't really equipped anymore to deal with. You see the day where they let some guy out um, of prison like the day before and he strangled a woman on the bus? I mean, just, you know, he got out and he immediately killed this woman and I think, you know, how would I feel if I were responsible mm. for that? It's unbelievably difficult, people who act on the side of defendants. I mean, it must be incredibly stressful work. I guess without them we have no system. Well, no, I think you have to really believe that a person deserves the best defense, you know, yeah. whether they're guilty or not. And the trick is you never ask them. Yeah. You never ask yeah. them if they 
seriously, unless you ask them to plead guilty. But if they want to go to trial, Once you as a lawyer, you, because if they told you you're guilty, you really have a tremendous problem. Mm -hmm. Why don't you wind up, before Patrick is lurking, uh, <laughs> telling us why you called it the murder rule, because it is a very specific point of law, and there is a reason for the title being called the murder rule. Yeah, it's a weird little bit of law, to be honest with you. Um, and it flies in the face of what I was taught as a young law student about criminal responsibility, which is that to be criminally responsible for something, you must have both committed the act and, yeah. and intended to commit the act. Those two things need to be in place. But the murder rule refers to the felony murder rule, which is that, it, in essence, if you commit a felony and there's a death during the felony, you can be found guilty of murder, whether or not you were directly involved. Now, some states have some protections in place to make sure the more extreme interpretations don't happen. Some do not. Two very strange convictions that I came across were one where a man committed an armed robbery with a friend. So he did do, he did do it. He was caught. He was arrested. He was handcuffed. He was placed in the back of a police vehicle. And he was still sitting there in his handcuffs when a police officer shot his accomplice dead. And he was found guilty of felony murder of his buddy's death. Um, another one where a young man was at a party and a friend of a friend approached him and said, can I borrow your car? Now, he agreed to lend the car. What happened in the conversation depends on whether you believe the defense or the prosecution. The prosecution say that the guy who was borrowing the car said, listen, I think it was his ex-girlfriend or a woman he knew anyway had his stuff in her house. He wanted to get his stuff back. And he said, if she's not there, I'm just going to break in and take it. That's if you believe the prosecution. If you believe the defense, that part of the conversation didn't happen. Either way, the guy said, yes, you may borrow my car. And then he went home, went to bed, fell asleep, and he was convicted of felony murder because the guy who borrowed the car went to the woman's house, broke in, she was there with her friend, there was a fight and he killed the friend. And so because the prosecution successfully argued that he knew the guy intended to break in, that's a felony, he's an accomplice to the felony, therefore he's guilty of felony murder. And I believe in that case, he, his, his sentence was longer than the guy who actually did the killing. So it's a very weird bit of law that seems to remove this thing about having to be responsible for only what you foresee or what you, you could be responsible for. So for that reason, it fit the book because yeah. apart from playing with the idea of murder rules, it was really about, you know, is Hannah responsible for all of the outcomes of her action? How about if she couldn't foresee it? You know, if she didn't foresee it happening, is she still responsible? Well, maybe if she should have foreseen it, if she had done the work, so I was kind of trying to answer that question too, and that's why it felt well, like Well, the key thing. word there is reasonably. You know, could yeah. she reasonably have? But how do you interpret reasonably? And that can go anyway. Probably the, the easiest illustration is that, let's say you're the getaway driver at a bank robbery, and inside the bank, your colleagues wind up shooting a guard or, or a teller or something. You as the getaway driver, even though you didn't go into the bank and even though you didn't shoot anybody, you are as guilty as the guys that did. So that's a simpler way of looking at it. Those are very extreme examples. Pretty extreme, that you mentioned. Yeah. 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 Patrick, did you have questions from anybody? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Have you already gone through the audience questions? No, we were, we were going to pause at this point to in. do that. But since you're out here, why don't <laughs> sure. you relay yeah. that question? <laughs> for those of you watching, thank you for asking questions. Yeah. Uh, Stefania from Italy is tuning in tonight. Oh, she, cool. she just says, you know, uh, uh, Dervla, you have a fascinating life story. Do you think that the, the ups and downs that you've experienced have all contributed to making you the writer you are today? Can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, oh, thank you, Stefania. She doesn't need to. Oh, you did. Oh, sorry. Oh, you, oh, Patrick's they can, already on they the can hear me. They can hear yeah. you. Okay. Um, can. Yes, I absolutely think it does. Because I think every experience you have as a writer feeds into who you are. And you have to feed that into your writing. You know, if you're, if you're a young writer or a new writer starting out, I think the best bit of advice you can be given is you have to find something you really care about and that you feel strongly enough before you start writing. Because otherwise, you're just going to write something you've seen on a shelf and it would be a pale imitation. Whereas if you write something you care about, it's the book only you can write. And that's where your voice comes from, your point of view and everything. And then all of your life experiences feed into that. They change who you are. And so that must change what ends up on the page. Rick. Anything else? Yeah. Um, the question for both of you guys. Um, uh, it's a question about social media. And tell us about your sort of relationship with it and uh, you know, how it helps you as a writer, or if it does. Tori, you want to go first? Um, how it helps me as a writer. Interesting. Um, 
it distracts that's for sure <laughs> when you know it's 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 a nice um avoidance tactic when the characters are being frustrated and not doing what i want them to do um you know social media is a tremendous marketing tool and it has been so amazing to see the connections that you make and the i feel like in the book world social media is used Social media, like in everything, can be used for good or ill. Mm -hmm. We could sit here and drop long lists of, you know, the pros and cons of social media. And I feel like in the book world, it's used for good. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for the community that I found mm -hmm. in the book world and the ability to get your book out there and get the word out there and to have other authors celebrate it and celebrate you and to, in turn, do the same thing. When I picked Dervla up um, tonight to come here and she got in the car and it was like, oh yeah, we're just meeting. <laughs> like we've never met before, but because of social media, you know, you feel like, you know, you, you know, know someone. So I'm really grateful for it from that standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I have a love-hate relationship with it for very similar reasons. I mean, Twitter is like, book publishing heaven, all book people all the time, and you get to know people you'd never know otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, and, and online events you'd never get to see or be part of. That's been amazing. Mm -hmm. Facebook is amazing for talking to readers and, and Instagram. Those two things are great. I Then the hate part is it's very distracting. Apart from the distraction, I think it's like that phone addiction thing is, is changes how your brain works. Yeah. Have you guys read the Cal, is it Cal Newport's Deep Work? Mm. It's such a good book about the importance of working deeply and, you know, that old way of sitting into something, which I also think is about reading, you know, the habit of sitting into a book for three or four hours and not going, you know, every ding, ding, minutes, ding you know, with your phone, which yeah. we all do. Yeah. So I have a real problem with it. I mean, I, part of me just wants to throw this into the nearest ocean and the other part of me carries it around 24 hours a day. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out the path on that one, you know. I think I need a dumb phone that I'm allowed to have so that the kids' schools can access me for like my main working hours and not have a smartphone with me all the time. Right. And I feel like that's the struggle we're all kind of coming up with, you know? I mean, we're, we're all, I feel like, having that battle with social media, which is hard also when you can, like I said, if you're looking, it's very easy to use as an avoidance tactic. If you don't know what you're writing and you're frustrated and don't want to continue on, you can convince yourself too. It's like, well, this is still this hard is work. To, this is yeah. work. <laughs> you can because, it's because work. it is I gotta be on Twitter. for marketing. Yeah. It's like, well, this is part of my job. Yeah. I can play on Facebook all day. That's uh, yeah, no, no, you know, not exactly. Not yes, really. but no. Yeah, no. Exactly. no. <laughs> Anything else? There was a you have a few Australian viewers, oh, and yeah, yeah, uh, guys. <laughs> they would like one of them would like to know if the new book is available over there yet. Yes, it is. It is absolutely. It's number one at the moment in Australia, so you should be able to find it in all the bookshops. So thank you. Hello. There are probably some more. Well, we we should ask you all now that we've done it backwards here. Do any of you have questions that you would like to ask either Tori or Durva? Will we see Cormac Riley again, or is he uh, retired? Oh, he's having a break, lucky Cormac. <laughs> he's very happy I'm not part of his life right now. Um, I think I got to the end of the third book, and I really did feel like I had put him through a lot. And I felt if I wrote another book right immediately, it would just be the same book, essentially, but slightly different circumstances, almost like an episodic thing. And I didn't want to do that, because I always want the character to grow during the book. So I had this sort of theory that he needed to get a little bit older and time needs to have gone by in his life a little bit and then I can come back and then I'll have that opportunity to move the layers through the story to make it a bit more meaningful. So yes, I definitely want to go back and you're, you may not be the first person to ask me on this tour, that particular <laughs> question. And every time someone asks me, I'm like, where is he now? What is he doing? And my brain starts working on this. So I think it brings it a little bit closer every time someone asks me yeah. that question. So, it's, it's so the corollary question is, what are you working on if it's not Cormac? Ooh, I'm working on a standalone novel. It's probably a little bit early to talk about it, but um, That's okay. it's basically, I'll give you the gist. It's a, there's a young couple who are very much in love, and they're really central to their community. They're very kind of beloved of this small community. It's not like they're the, you know, the football god and the cheerleader. It's not like that. They're just very loved. Their parents are very much embedded in the community. And these, this young couple go on a trip, and only he comes back. She doesn't come back. And he explains what happened, what happened, but it's, there's just something not quite right. It doesn't quite make sense. His story doesn't quite add up. People don't know what happened to her. His parents are immediately worried for him. They close ranks. 
protect, protect at, by all, at all costs without even really asking him the difficult questions. Her parents are desperate to know what has happened and start their own little investigation. And the community starts to kind of take sides and then it all starts to unspool to get to the truth. But there are a lot of secrets that have to be unveiled along the way. Where is this community? Well, it's in small town anywhere at the moment <laughs> because I haven't had a chance ah, to travel. Okay. I have an idea where I'm going to set it, but I don't want to say yet because okay. I want to go there and spend ah. time there and I haven't had a chance because this is my first opportunity. Australia did not allow us to leave the country until very That's recently. Right. Yeah. Borders were closed, so I couldn't go anywhere. And, and how has your tour been? She's been all over the country. She, you, you were on Tamron Hall the other day I was on, on TV. Hall how was that? Was Wearing this exact shirt because I have very few clothes. Mm. <laughs> um, it was great. It was weird. It was great. I mean, I, I just did my Perth event. I did one Sydney event. And then I came to the US. Most of my Australian tour is still waiting for me when I get home. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then Ireland and then home. So I'm not home till the 27th of May. Oh. But I just, it was very quick in, in the US. I mean, I flew into LA late, I was lost track of days, and evening. And then the next day, I had nine interviews in a row from my computer at my hotel room, went to an event that night. So I literally didn't leave my hotel room. And then the next morning, I was on a flight to New York, um, where I did an event as soon as I arrived in my hotel room that night, got up, did the Tamron Hall show, got in a plane, flew to Atlanta for Karen Slaughter and Jocelyn Jackson. Uh, slept, got back in the plane, back to New York, interviewed Don Windsor at the Center for Fiction last night. Slept, got up, came here. <laughs> and then tomorrow I go to LA and I sleep and then I go back to Brisbane and I've got a really big event, 200 people in Brisbane the first night I go back and the second night I go back. I've got a UK online event the first night I go back. I don't know what's happening after that because I can't keep track of it. <laughs> but it's Luckily basically it's a long flight. A lot, yes, I've been sleeping for most of that. And then it's, it's Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney, Dublin, Galway, Dublin, home. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. But it's, I mean, who gets to do that? Every writer wants to have an opportunity to do sure. that. So I'm lucky, very lucky. You're back. Another question, or are you just watching? Working. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have a question? Well, do you have, do you have uh, relatives in the Garda? Because your first three books you know, sort of opened up quite a bit. The guard, the sheep owner. Yeah. I don't have relatives. I do. My brother um, was good friends with a guy, a sergeant, who was in his triathlon club. And he was very kind. He talked to me on the phone, told me quite a few bits and pieces, which really helped me. And I read the their annual reports, which I know sounds painfully boring. <laughs> and it wasn't the most interesting thing in the world. But what you learn from that is the language they use to refer to their own work, which helped. And then a lot of just the rhythm of it just comes from your own, you know, work. I've never worked as a Garda, but I've worked in open plan offices. I know what that feels like. There are people you love, people you tolerate, and there's always one person you can't stand, you know. And it's just that vibe, I think, is the same everywhere because people are people. So no family, but got kind of close. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thank Corey, you did you, you have a final time. question you wanted to ask that I've interrupted? Um, no, I don't. Actually, I did have one more question. There's okay. a um, interesting relationship in the book between mother and daughter. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? It really stuck out because it's yeah. not your typical depiction of a mother-daughter relationship. It was it anything more to speak on that? Yeah, I, I think the thing I was interested in there is that um, that relationship that can turn from that loving reliance on each other into something a little bit different yeah. where sometimes there's a it, oh, it doesn't happen very often but it does happen where the parent feels that they there's an ownership almost you know it changes from that sort of protection and that love and that involvement in someone's life to you're mine and I need you to belong to me and be driven by me at all times and when it when the person wants their independence, then that can become very dangerous. Either the person learns to let go, or things can get really interesting. I wanted to see what happened when things got really interesting. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> very. I feel like we've led some Teetering very good. on the edge yes, of the spoiler there. <laughs> yes. Some very good clues to like. All right, get reading. Yeah, yeah, well, clearly, there's a lot to digest when you read the book. A lot of surprises, but a lot of things going on, and it's quite educational. Um, if you're at all interested in the criminal justice system and the Innocence Project, you will learn a lot. I do think that Hannah is guilty of one really reprehensible act, 
Um, but otherwise, um, she, and you know, morality is a fluid thing in a book like this, I think, and so you have to decide whether, whether that's within your own limits, whether your own tolerance can accept what she does or, mm. or not. Um, as you say, she's really goal-oriented. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Right. In any case, um, Drivel is going to sign books for you, so let's give her a round of applause. And Tori, too. Thank you, Tori. And we'll be, we'll be seeing Tori again. She's a wonderful moderator, so she'll probably be here next week with us with Adrian McKinney. And um, I may hook her into doing something in July with Linda Castillo, who's an author I'm extremely fond of, and I think they have much in common, so we'll see how that works out. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.